Allah has given each and every one of us the ability to be here today. Uh, for that we say Alhamdulillah and we send our salutation, peace and blessings to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, on the, uh, this uh, very blessed day, very blessed night, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Uthman Latif, Sheikh uh, Dr. Uthman Latif, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, who is an author, he works with the Sapien Institute, MashaAllah, uh, most of you brothers may be very aware of Brother Muhammad Hijab, so MashaAllah, yeah, they uh, work together. And the Sheikh, MashaAllah, his PhD is in uh, the Crusades, Alhamdulillah. So the uh, Sheikh, inshallah, will be um, giving us a wonderful nasiha. Uh, we hope to all listen attentively and pay attention to what the Sheikh is saying, and inshallah, benefit uh, from this nasiha. May Allah accept it from us. Barakallah fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Allah wa Muhammad. Wa ala ala Muhammad, bi ala kulli dhar alif alif marra, kamati wa tarada, ya Allah, rahma rahimeen. It's a really beautiful being in your very esteemed company, alhamdulillah, today, and hearing from our Imam in the Quran. There are many lessons, in fact, for us to take, inshallah, today. And the focus, of course, today's talk is on the life of. Salah al al Ayyubi rahimahullah. Many of us are familiar with a bit about his life. I want to begin by saying that we should not ever think that any one person's life exists in, uh, in isolation from other people's valid and valuable con- contributions. Everybody, in fact, who comes to be is a consequence of many other people along the way as well. So, Allah gives us therefore a very beautiful paradigm in the Quran. I'll begin with this to, to make you understand the point. In the Quran we have the example of great people, personalities like Isa alayhi salam or Maryam alayhi salam. But all of this in fact from a Quranic perspective begins from a point of view of a great aspiration. All of you young people must begin life with that, a great aspiration and intention. So Allah in the Quran begins telling us about the mother of Maryam alayhi salam, Hanna. And Allah says that when the wife of Imran, she says, Rabbi Habli, Rabbi inni nadartu laka, ma fi wati muharrara. My Lord, whatever is moving in my womb, I dedicate for your service. Meaning, beginning with an aspiration, an intention. And Allah says, and Allah says, and when she gave birth to a girl rather than a boy, it was against some kind of expectation because if you're a boy in uh, ancient Judea, you'd have more chance to do more things in life. Maybe a scholar, a scribe, an orator, speaker, maybe a teacher. But if you're a girl, you can't do as much as a boy can do. And Allah says, she gave birth to a girl. And then she says, Rabbi, I've given birth to a girl. Well, he said, dhikr, kal unta, and a boy isn't like a girl. But still, wa inni sabaytu ha Maryam, and I've named her Maryam. And I seek protection with you for her, from shaitan and and for a progeny. So everything begins with an aspiration. What happens in life if things don't always go based upon your plan? What if you intend something in life? What if something else happens in life? What if you're confronted with something in life that goes against your expectation? What do you do? But Allah is teaching us that even though Maryam gave, Hannah gave birth to a girl, Maryam alayhi salam, she still persevered and persisted. That's determination. So what should follow then from an aspiration is a very concerted determination. Salah al-Din didn't get where he got to in life without people pushing him and backing him and funding him and financing him and supporting him along the way. All those other people are also heroes for us. In your life, wherever you get to in life, there's been parents praying for you. In the night, crying for you. Fathers, mothers, imams, people have been you know, backing you, supporting you, vouching for you. So no one gets to where they get to in life without a whole corpus of an enterprise of iman behind them, backing them to get to where they got to. And then what happens? So Allah says, فَتَقَبَّلَهَا Allah accepted the vow she made. وَأَنْ بَتَهَنَا بَاتًا حَسَنًا 
And she grows up, Allah says, like, like Allah used to say, well, like a plant, Nabat is a plant. And she grows up like a plant grows up. But how does a plant grow up? Not because you want it to grow up and, and live and exist. A plant doesn't just happen to be. There is somebody behind the scene cultivating the plant, watering the plant, taking care of the plant, placing the plant in the right place. And that's Maryam. She's placed in Masjid al-Aqsa. In the third most sanctified spot on earth. And the second Masjid built in the first Qibla, al-Aqsa. That distant far mosque. The land and home of so many prophets of Allah, including of course, her son Isa alayhi And Zakri alayhi And Maryam alayhi and, and Ibrahim and Lot and Suleiman, Dawood, so many prophets of Allah are based in that land. But Allah says she grows up like this, like a, like a plant. Zakaria. Now here comes a key thing because in order for you to have sustained growth in life, you should have good teachers, good mentors. Salah Hadeen had Nuruddin, had people around him, even Qudama. Ibn Shaddad, Al Isfahani, all people around Salah Adin vouching for him, helping and assisting him. So Allah says, Maryam alayhi salam had Zakariya was over her, guarding her, protecting her. So in your life, imagine you've had so many good teachers around you Imams, scholars, this Imam, everyone around you of the masjid and school, all those people. They contribute to your greatness when you grow up. And Allah says, then what happens? So you have aspiration, determination, you have cultivation. And Allah says, when Maryam and Zukri would see Maryam in the mihrab, that's in the Masjid al-Aqsa, the mihrab. He would found, find provisions. The ulama, they say, if it was the winter, then they would, he would find the fruits of the summer. If it was summer, fruits of the winter. Miracles, miracles are happening. He says, Ya Maryam, Anna al-Qihada, where is this coming from? She said, Huwa min andalah, Allah is bringing it. Allah is doing it. We don't say, we are who we are on account of ourselves. That's like the Qarun and Fir'aun and Haman and Iblis, that's their way of thinking. We say, any step we take in life is because Allah allowed it to be. We sit back and we think about the words of Musa when he gets to Madian. And he helps the girls who couldn't water their sheep. And he the, comes and Allah says, uh, comes to the shade and he says, Rabbi, inni, my Lord, I am for whatever you've blessed me with, min khairun faqir, I am desperately in need of. So miracles happen, but it doesn't end there. Because don't think that once the plan is all beautifully done, Salah Hadeen is all, you know, amazing things happen. Battle of Hittin and the reconquest of Al-Quds. What's going to happen after that? Allah says that when Zakaria alayhi salam, he sees Maryam and miracles happening, what does he do? Allah says, next ayah, هُنَالِكَ دَعَى زَكَرِيَ رَبَّهُ Huwanalika means at that point, there, there. Zakriya prays to his Lord, My Lord, Rabbi Habli Miladunka. My Lord, give me from you, gift me a pure project. Meaning he had no children. He wanted a child like this child, like Maria. So whatever you create in your life can become an inspiration for other people. If you think carefully, aspiration, determination, cultivation, inspiration. So everybody, therefore, is a consequence of what was there once before. Someone pushing them along. People might not know that the, the Crusades don't begin with Urban II and Clermont calling Crusade. They begin before that time. Genesis began, began in fact, the Crusades in Al-Andalus, in Islamic Spain. Muslims had the biggest empire in Islamic Spain, Al-Andalus. But what happened? So you had all these points of growth. Great rulers like Abdul Rahman II, the first, the third, you know, great rulers. And you had the 
industry and growth and civilization and luminaries of maths and science and astronomy and Arabic and all these things. But then the Muslims slowly began to think of themselves like too powerful. Provincial governors became too powerful. And when they became powerful, they became autonomous, like as if I am the ruler of my own land. I don't need anybody interference. When this happened, the Christians took advantage of it. They saw, you know, you guys, you, 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 you can divide. And the vision and the hadith is, is a punishment. The farq is adab, weakness. Weakness. If you divide, you become weak. And that's what happened. So all these big states of Toledo and Cordoba and Seville and Granada and Aziz, all these big states became autonomous entities. The Christians took advantage of it. They had the state in the north, Leon, Castile, Navarre, Aragon, big states. And they made the Muslim states subservient to them, have to pay them money. Have paid the money to save them from other Muslim states. And so the, crusades, so the Christians called for crusades, for other Christians to rally themselves and fight and retake these territories. Popes, Alexander III, Gregory VII, Urban II, called for what came to be known as crusade. That if you go and fight the Muslims and take these lands from them and you die, you get to heaven. And your sins are all forgiven, all promises of heaven and everything else. That's where it began. But then you had the uh, situations in Ummah. What's happened? You have difficulty because the Abbasid Khilafah has become overthrown by the Fatim and Shia Khilafah. The Fatimids are taking power. They take power over Maghrib. President of Morocco in 909, take power over Baghdad 945, take power over Egypt, defeat the Ikshidids in 969. That means that they've taken all the major centers of power of the Abbasids, the Fatimids. That means once upon a time. The Fatimids were ruling Swedes of Muslim territory. The Abbasid Khalif is captured. It's placed like on in house arrest in Baghdad. Imagine the Khalif. He has no power. Until you had in time and years going by, you had the Khalif that comes along Al Qadr, the Abbasid Khalif Al Qadr. And he writes these epistles like promoting the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Sunni Islam. But he has no power, but he's trying his best, but he has no power. He's writing things down, but he has no power. And it would take the, the, the first soldier Sultan called Tughri al-Beg to come along and would defeat the Fatimids. You had the re-emergency of, of, of the Sunni Islam in, in Baghdad. From that point onwards, Fatimids are defeated. Part, defeated at least in the, that part they're defeated then something else happens in the year 1092 called the year of the death of the Khalifs so as if that wasn't bad enough something else happens everyone dies Sunni Khalif dies Fatima the Khalif dies his wazir Badr Jumali dies Saudi Sultan Malik Shah dies his wazir Nizam Mulki dies in the same year in the same year, one year, all these major rulers just die. So imagine the instability, the division, the chaos, the confusion, all this is happening. And then 1095 happens. So just one or two years after that, Urban II in Claremont announces calls for a crusade and calls for the Christians to come together, unite, help the, the Eastern Church and go and fight the Muslims and retake in their minds Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa, to defend the Christian Church called the Holy Sepulchre. 
And these people who are hearing him are like brigands and thieves and murderers and rapists, bad people. And for them it was a chance, I mean, if I can get to heaven, if I can fight once in my life rather than fighting my fellow man, Christian man, I'll fight the Muslims and get to heaven. What does he do like today? What does he do? You see, today what's happening, when you see the news about Gaza and Palestine, the whole industry, Pharaonic industry, is on full display. You know, the most repeated story in the Quran is Musa a.s. against Pharaoh, his antagonist. Again and again, all our pieces, different surahs, different times, different places. That's the same story. But different things, different actors. Not just Musa, Harun's there. Magicians are there. Haman's there. Harun's there. All these people, different actors are there. Musa's mother plays a role. Very powerful, important role. But the magicians were like the media machinery around Pharaoh. They were the ones that validated his existence. They were the ones that spun this, this magic to make people believe that the rule that they're serving deserves their loyalty and their worship. <coughs> Today, the same kind of stories against the Muslimin of Gaza calling them human animals. Abu II, when he called the crusade, called the Muslims heathen, barbaric, savage. He said that Muslims in Jerusalem sacrificed babies at the altars in the mosque Al-Aqsa. Made such a, a lie, propaganda against the Muslims that the Christians told them well, they must be, must be fought against. The same things happening today. The new stories that they change and that they develop. And they say, you speak about mass rapes, and then they say, this was a false story. And killing and beheading of babies, and it's a false story. But these things come in people's minds that the people must be savage if they do that. It's a f fake story. Same thing in the Crusades. So when this happens, 1099, they get to Jerusalem and they commit a massacre of Muslims in Jerusalem, killing thousands, genocide of them, massacre. And they take control of Jerusalem. Now the responses are a few. How do you respond to that? How do the Muslims react to that? On the one hand, you had military responses, attempts, like the attempts of Al Ghazi, Qilij al Salan, 1098, Al Ghazi, 1119, military attempts to take back stuff, territory. You had Muslim scholars like Ali ibn Tara Sulami, who wrote a book called Kitab al Jihad. And his hope was that if he writes this book, he's appealing to the Kharif, send your army to defend Al, al Quds al Sharif, Al Aqsa. Muslims, unify your affairs. This division, forget about it. Calling the Muslims to some action. You had poets like Ibn al khayrat al Abi Wardi writing verses of poetry against crusaders, about the Muslims, about the fact that you have to unify and fix up your situation. But, there is, but the response, even though you had these few great people, wasn't there. The power of crusaders was, was big power. They're coming as, as settlers in the land and taking territory. They make the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. So even though there was some kind of reaction response, it wasn't big enough to create an uproar. Until the year 1144. Now by this time, 40 years have passed. In that 40 years, Muslim subjugation, crusader uh, expansion. 1144, a man called Imad al-Din Zengi was a ruler of Mosul and Aleppo, head of a family called the Zengid family. He defeats the crusaders in a very important way. He retakes crusader state. 
They had four states, Tripoli, Edessa, Antioch, and, or Acre, and Jerusalem. Four big powerful states. He takes one of them, Edessa. But when this happens, it gives the Muslim a sense of hope that maybe now we can one day potentially take Jerusalem because we've taken the big state called Edessa. Therefore, all poetry, unification, efforts, mobilization begins. And the future is for Al-Aqsa, Jerusalem. But Imad al-Din Zengi wasn't going to live that long, gets assassinated. It's his son called Nur al-Din Zengi. And Nur al-Din Zengi has in front of his amazing, massive mission. He has Sham. But it's a problem. Sham is divided. Aleppo is divided with Damascus. Damascus are making allies with the Crusaders against Muslims because they're scared of the ruler of Aleppo. And Nur al-Din says, you know what, this is, this is terrible. There's no way on earth you can defeat the Crusaders and take, bring back Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa, in this state because you're so divided and enemies of one another. So he makes it therefore his goal to unify Asham. Makes it a goal. This animosity and hatred has to stop like today. One of our imperatives, obligations upon us as an Ummah is to sow the seeds of unity and trust and goodwill and brotherhood amongst the Muslims. Sometimes, you know, we have this shake-up call, like what's happening now in Gaza. Completely barbarity, savage, killing of babies and children and mothers and fathers, ongoing bombardment. But it comes as a wake-up call for us, to wake us up from our sleep and slumber. Haven't you felt that? Haven't you felt? Haven't you felt that? I think everybody's felt that. The sense of, you know, we're actually an ummah. All these different things that divide us, the curse of nationalism, nation states, sykes Pico, these divisions, and nothing have no value. So you're not, you're not good because you're Bangladeshi, or good because you're Pakistani, or good because you're Kuwaiti, has no value. Allah in the Quran says, this ummah of yours is one ummah. Fa'abuduni. Allah says, this is one ummah. If one part of the ummah is in pain, the Prophet says, the whole body is in pain. So we have to really reinforce it amongst ourselves, this importance of being one as an ummah. Our concerns being one. Our blood is one. Our loyalties are one and the same. Don't let people divide you and make you think, no, that's a, that's a deceitful tactic. They're one of them. Nur al-Din therefore has this, but, but Nur al-Din does something else. He realizes it's not just about the fact that we unify a sham. We've got to make sure that we do things for Allah's sake. That means that every, all the jihad efforts we should do have to be based upon an increasing of iman. So Nur al-Din was described as Dhul Jihad bin Adain min Aduin wa Nafs as the one who encompassed two jihads against the enemy and against himself. The poet said, Ya Nur al-Din, Mada taqool ida waqafta bi mawkifan faradan dhalilu al-hisabu asiru wa ta'allakat fi mal khusum wa anta fi yum al-hisab masalsul majroor wa tafarakat anka al-junood wa anta fi al-dhikr al-qubur masal maqbur They're saying they're giving Nur al-Din, that Nur al-Din, what would you say before Allah when you're standing alone before Him and all of your sins are exposed? What would you say when all your enemy leaves and departs from you? They're saying, Nur al-Din, prepare for yourself before Allah an excuse. Do something for the Ummah. Have something for the Ummah. Like today, for example, we see ourselves 
And in comparison to what Muslims are suffering in Palestine, in Gaza, the ease, the comfort. And Allah gives us therefore these reminders that that's how they live their life. Haven't you seen lost all dunya we think? I saw a, a, a video of a boy who was standing on the on, on rubble, on rubble, what might have been his home, on rubble. And a man asks him, aren't you scared? And he says, Nakhaf min Allah, we fear from Allah. We fear only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I saw a video of a, th- a three, maybe a three-year-old boy looking at rubble and raising his hand and saying, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. So if people therefore in that situation who have lost so much can still remember Allah, why do you think people are embracing Islam now? It's seeing people like that in that state. The power of Iman, the language of Iman speaks even in the most difficult situation. It's a reminder for us how dare we complain when something small happens in our life, how dare we do that? I mean, how shameful it would be for small losses, we make a big thing. What about them? They've lost everything in a dunya we sense. It's a reminder for us. The Prophet would say, Allahumma la aish illa aish al akhirah. Oh Allah, there's no life except uh, life of akhirah. It's a reminder. So Nur al Zengi therefore takes on this mantle of, of spirit ensuring people are praying on time to ensuring that people are praying Qiyam al-Layl Tahajjud night prayers people giving Sadaqah reciting Qur'an learning Qur'an he creates around him a beautiful atmosphere of piety but two important things are going to happen in this time period one in 1131 one in 1137. So what happens? If you go back to Imad al-Din Zengi, before he assassinated, you see Imad al-Din Zengi, he would make these raids into Muslim territories, wanting land, power. And once in that year, he makes a raid into Baghdad, the center of the Abbasid Khilafah, makes a raid and he's defeated. What does he do? He goes and he seeks safety in a place, place called Tikrit. In Tikrit, you have a man called Najm al-Din Ayyub, guarding Tikrit. So what does he do? He gives safety to Imad al-Din Zengi, even though it's against like it's against expectation. You would think that a you would just grasp him up because he's fought against the Khilaf, the Khalif. Doesn't this for some reason Allah knows best, but he just keeps him safe. After seven days or so, he, he, he sends him back to his homeland in Mosul, Aleppo. That's finished now. Now, 1137, what happens? In Tikrit, Ayyub has a brother called Shirku. And they do something. Shirku, he kills someone by mistake. For that reason, they're expelled. Expelled from Tikrit as a punishment. On the day they're expelled from Tikrit, Salah Haddin al Ayyubi is born. On the day they're expelled from Tikrit, on that day, Salah Haddin Yusuf ibn Ayyub is born. So what happens? Zengi remembers a favor that this man gave him five, six years before. So he invites them all to Mosul and Aleppo. And they all go there. So Salah Haddin, as a young boy, is benefiting from the environment of <coughs> Nur al-Din, the madrasas of Nur al-Din, the learning, the scholars, Around Nur al-Din, Salah Hadin is learning from that. It's like young boys, you guys. Maybe you live in this town 
but you already have a masjid. That means already people before you put the thought into building a masjid, having a masjid. Got the money ready for the masjid. Maybe you work together as families for the sake of having the masjid ready. So now young people, young people, young boys and girls, they benefit from that. Take advantage of that. Salah Hadin was in this situation. He doesn't build a masjid himself. I mean, it's already there because Nur al-Din Zengi's efforts, hard work. But Nur but Salah Hadin benefits from it. What does he do? As a young person, Salah Hadin, in seeing the rise of the Crusaders, realizes he has to do something. Two key things. One, in order for success to come, he has to leave a life of sin. Leave a life of sin. Not lead, but leave a life of sin. Sometimes for us as Muslims, the biggest obstacle is sin. It's sin. It's shaitan's hold on a person. And he grips you, grabs you. He's very cunning. Allah says he is aduun fattakhidu adu, it's your enemy, take him as an enemy. And knows therefore how to capitalize on you. And leave you, lead you down the very dark and deep hole. Because shaitan knows what your weakness is. Salah Hadin was like any other boy in his town. He has to leave sins. To find an opening. See, there's something beautiful when you leave, when you do something for Allah's sake. You say to Allah, Ya Allah, this is a sin that's tempting me. But I would leave this for your sake. Allah would open for you doors of gold. Doors of gold. Treasures from the heavens. So much blessings in your life. The moment you decide to leave a sin for Allah's sake. But the sin itself will trap you. If you follow its path, it will trap you. And Allah says, shaitan. Don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. That means those footsteps, other people before you, millions of people before you, have taken the same footsteps. It's taken them nowhere else except Jahannam. The Prophet told Ali to say, Ali, he would say, Ali, say, Allah Mahdini wa Saddidni. Oh Allah, guide me and set me straight. Set me straight. Salah so Hadin, therefore, leaves the path of sins. And secondly, he has these assassination attempts on his life, twice. So what does he do? It makes him realize, life, my dear brothers, is short, temporal. We're not going to be here forever. We won't live forever. Every day of your life, look at yourself in the mirror. You're aging. We're, aging. We're all aging. Aging. You know? Some brothers say, stay young. <laughs> I've done it for how many years, subhanAllah? 20 years, a lot. More than that. Maybe more than that, you know. More than that, subhanAllah. And Allah blesses us to be just sometimes just in different massages and this and that, you know. But he always looks as young as I remember him. SubhanAllah. But we're all actually, we're all actually aging. <laughs> we're getting weaker and more frail. And this is, a, this is life. We're going through this. So that should be a reminder. If life isn't all that long, all we have is now to make a difference. You in your life, whatever you decide to do now will have maximum impact later on. And everybody around you, your kids, your wives, your neighbors are all witnessing you. If you make that step towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will just enrich you in so many ways. But if you don't, we all remain trapped. Salah Hadin, therefore, two people, attempts, people are trying to kill him, the Hashashin assassins. And Allah saves him. But it reminds him, life is short. Let's do something today. So, raised, therefore, in the environment of Nur al-Din, benefits from this environment, has these things happen in the life. He becomes a mature person. And he's sent in a very important time. 
with his uncle Shirku to Egypt. Nur ad-Din sends them all to Egypt to do what? To reinstate a Fatimid wazir called Shawar. Because Nur ad-Din in his mind he thought you're better having the Fatimids in Egypt rather than having the Crusaders in Egypt. So let's put it back in power. He they do that. Then Shawar betrays them, allows the Crusaders. Nuruddin realizes this is the end, we should defeat him. So Salah Hadin has these very important victories. 1170, he takes the port of Eilat. Eilat becomes very important because it becomes a, a port that allows the Hujjaj, the pilgrims, to travel across safely. 1171 defeats the Fatimid Khilaf, the Khalif in, 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 in Cairo. The last one called Al Adid, he dies. <coughs> Salah Adin takes power, becomes the ruler of, of Egypt. 1172, he goes and defeats uh, North Africa, Barqa, and Tripoli, brings them under a fold of, of, of unity. 1173, he deals with rebels in Sudan, making trouble. So all of these become very major events for him. And for 12 years, 11, 1174 to 86, 12 years, his focus is on Syria, Egypt, Palestine, and Iraq. To bring Muslims together, to unify our affairs. Because you realize that they're doing to us today, and they were doing it. Nur al-Din dies in 1974, they began by making friction. Syria, fine, united, fine, but we're going to make friction. We're going to make this person hate that person. And you over there, you hate him over there. And we'll find something small, <coughs> but we'll make it seem big. And it will seem big. And then you will die, but your kids will have that sense of resentment forever against that person's kids. And this will just continue. That's called division, it's called weakness. You have families, my dear brothers. You've got to create peace and love in your families. Don't make it so that you know one brother is against the other brother. Because no one was brave enough to say, I'm sorry, let's start afresh. Don't make it like that. The shaitan has grabbed you has just gripped you. Because shaitan's purpose is, is division, to divide you. You don't want that to happen. You know, be people of goodness and, and warmth and empathy, kindness to one another. Make peace. We make mistakes, fine to say sorry. Let's move on. If you don't do that, shaitan isn't stupid. I mean, he's going to capitalize on that moment and make you more divided enemies. And then your kids will suffer, and their cousins will suffer. And you all suffer because you're all divided, fragmented. We talk about unity, you're divided amongst yourselves. We can't ask Allah, Allah, I want your mercy, but that we end up being the least merciful, the most cruel people. Can't be like that. And so Salah Hadin has these major victories, unification of the Ummah, realizing. Al-Andalus happened, Sicily happened, Jerusalem happened, and their tactic is one and the same, divide and conquer. Divide us, conquer us. And he realizes that this cannot happen again. It has to be that we work as a collective body. So what happens? A very important year, 1186, by the way, so Salah Hadin is big, mature. I mean, he was ruler of Egypt from the age of 32. So he's in a position of authority. You know, you should give, give, give young people positions of responsibility. That will mature them. And maybe you're already doing it. Make a young person in charge of locking the doors, in charge of cooking the food, in charge of this, in charge of that, because you make them mature. They have responsibility. Young people are, are, are brave. We don't want to make them to be like cowards. Responsible. Young people are leading the Ummah. You know, we're, we're looking at young people 
And we have great hope for you because you will lead us afterwards and we will look upon you for leadership. You will lead us. So we want young people to have those tools, those skills of leadership today because it will serve them tomorrow. So Salah al therefore, was a young boy, a person, and he's ruling the whole of Egypt. 1186 comes, what happens? Salah al takes his whole army to a place called Tiberias, which is in the West Bank. May Allah save the Muslims of the West Bank, Amen. Palestine. Amen. Tiberias has a water source. He takes his whole army at the water source. <coughs> and then they find something. They find in one of the castles is a wife of a crusader. A very prominent crusader. Now, of course, Islam doesn't tell us to harm women. No. Islam tells us to honor women. She's, she's just there looking after the castle. See, it's like today, for example. What happens? They take hostages. What do they say? They say, you see, we don't harm women and children. They come on the thing, TV, and they say, we're doing this because the Prophet taught us not to harm women and children. And in Islam, we don't harm women and children. She's there as a woman, she's there. But the Crusaders then panic. And they take their whole army on the, at the western side. West Bank, that's the eastern side, Tribers, western side. Another lake called Safuria. You see, now the Zionists, they didn't call it. They, they, you know when the Zionists took, when the Zionists expelled the Muslims from Palestine in 1948, they didn't expel the Muslims. They reshaped the landscape. They changed the names. They destroyed 300 villages in Palestine. They built on the villages supermarkets, car parks, planted trees to make it look as if no one else used to live here before. So Safariya, now you won't find it any, anywhere, it's called Safariya. It's called Zapuri. Zapuri. Basma today is called Biznet. They changed the names and they Hebrewized them to make them sound as if these Israelis have always lived here with these in these locations. No, it wasn't like that. Safuria, we we'll call it Safuria because that's its real name. The Crusaders went there in Safuria and they're panicking because they think that Salah Hadin is going to grab that woman and do bad things. Now, other Crusaders are thinking, you know what, it ain't going to happen because they're Muslims, because they never do that kind of stuff. We shouldn't panic. But the head of the Knights nice Templars, Gerard de Reitfeld, and this bad person called uh, 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 Reginald, Reginald de Chatelon, convinced the King of Jerusalem that we should now move out because we should attack them because they're going to do bad things. They make a cataclysmic error. And in the daytime, when it's very hot and everyone needs water, they leave to fight the Muslims. They leave in the daytime, very hot. They leave the water supply. And they say, don't worry, we're going to get to a well. Salah Hadini fills all the wells with rocks and stones and they have no access to the water. And they're so fatigued, lethargic, lost morale. And Salah Hadin and his army are prepared for them. And they defeat them. This Fahani says that the number of dead was so many, you wouldn't believe anybody taken prisoner. And the number of prisoners were so many, you wouldn't believe anybody had died. It was one of the greatest of all the victories of Battle of Hattin. And Salah Hadin is victorious. Everyone's taken prisoner. King of Jerusalem, the nice templates, this shaitan of a person. You know, the Chatelon. All, everybody's prisoners, all the big ones, prisoners. 
In a very famous scene, you've probably seen it before, where they had a tent and Salah din you know, he gives a glass of water to the king of Jerusalem and he drinks it. He says, you see, because a king can't kill a king, I can't kill you if I'm giving you water. And then uh, in Jerusalem, he gives it to his buddy, Ronald Shetelon, the person who tried to come to the Hijaz and attack Makkah and Medina. It was called the Red Sea Incursion, 1183. Salahuddin sent Usama Din and Lu'lu to repel that happen. But he said that if I ever catch him, I'm going to kill him. Because of how much animosity and aggression is showed against the Muslims. And by the way, the reason why the Muslims went to Hattin is because this person broke a truce with the Muslims, attacked the caravan, took its money, killed its people, and these were pilgrims traveling for the Hajj. So now the day has come and they're all caught, captured. And so what happens is that the king of Jerusalem he gives the water to his friend, Renaud Chatelon, and then he drinks it. So Ahadin says, I didn't give you the water. He did. And he invites him to Islam. He refuses and he has him killed. In fact, Salah Din killed all the Knights Templars on that day. Because these were people who were trained to fight Muslims. Who were like military trained to fight Muslims and he had them all killed on that day. This was the biggest victory in that time. And it led to the reconquest of Jerusalem. They're now on the way to retake Jerusalem. But there's two things happening. One, on his mind, all these uh, all these uh, coastline states, Acre, Acre uh, Beirut, you know, Ascalon, are still in Crusader hands. So he sends some of his army to fight against those places, and then he takes his army to Al Quds Sharif, Al Aqsa, takes his army there. And when he's going there, I'll tell you one thing. One of those who was fighting in Hattin was a man called Balian of Ibelin. He escapes, but his wife and kids are in Jerusalem. Maria Komninas and the kids. So he meets Salah Hadin. He says, look, I'm going to Jerusalem as well, so are you. Allow me permission to take out the wife and the kids from Jerusalem. Permission. Salah Adin says, yeah, but you fought against us. Salah Adin says, on a condition you don't fight against us again. Go to Jerusalem. And Balian now is petitioned by the patriarch of Jerusalem, the Christian patriarch. He says to Balian that you have to become our king. But he says that I can't because I made a promise to Salah Adin that I couldn't fight against him again. And he says, you have all oaths against Muslims are invalid, don't worry about that. So he has to write a letter against Salah Adin saying that, you know what, I, I can't, I have to fight and protect Jerusalem, but still allow my wife and kid to leave. Salah Adin not only allows the wife and kids to leave, he gifts them with clothing and fruits for the journey back home. There was something in Salah Adin's character in that he melded these two amazing attributes of courage and compassion. That he was so remarkable. Stanley Poole says that if the only thing we know of Salah Hadin was the fact that he retook Jerusalem, that would be sufficient in saying he was one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all military generals. If that's all we know about him. Because when he's on his way there, and people are saying, we're going to kill all of them. Vengeance. Because First Crusade, they killed everybody. Massacre. Salah Adin says, no, we'll make it mercy. Like the Prophet's Fatul Makkah. Come back to Makkah. People are saying, vengeance. The Prophet is saying, today is merciful day. Let them live in peace under Islam. Salah Adin, so when people are coming out and there's a, a later siege, Northeastern wall is, is cracked open. The victory is near. In order to protect the sites, Al-Aqsa Masjid, 
Dome of the Rock, Salah Adin makes peace with Balian. For every man that would leave 10 dinars as a ransom, every woman 5 dinars, every child 2 dinars. Many couldn't afford it. Salah Adin pays himself, pays for them to leave. Shows magnanimity of character, discipline of character, piety of iman of character. That he was someone who was compassionate. There was a Christian woman in Acre, you know, someone stole her baby. Went in there and the tenant took the baby out to sell it on the black market. In, the, in Ibn Shaitan's account, it says a woman went to her own people, princes, and said, I, I want my baby back. Can I ask Sal Hadin? And they said, Yeah, but he's not Christian. Then they said, But he is merciful, you can ask him. And uh, the woman goes and she says, Salah Hadin, please, I need help to bring my baby back. Saladin takes money from his own pocket, like takes his own stuff and gives it to people to find the child before it's sold. And Ibn Shatat says, I saw Saladin weeping, crying for that lady. Allah. Beware of zulm. It's darkness is your qiyam. Beware of zulm. Beware of injustice. And there was Saladin standing there crying over that woman because someone stole her baby. He therefore combined these two amazing attributes of courage and compassion. Kind and merciful he was, and brave and resilient he was. So when they took Al Quds, Jerusalem, and Christians have to now leave Jerusalem, and Muslims enter Jerusalem. After 88 years, he gets rose water and he cleanses Al Quds with a new smell. He takes off all of the uh, pictures of saints that Catholics have. He puts Islamic inscriptions. He brings in Qurans from Damascus to place around Al Aqsa Mission. And after 88 years, Al-Quds Sharif in Aqsa was returned to the Muslims. More will happen because now they will launch a third crusade. And crusaders are going to panic. They panic. The last Pope, when he has the news, he dies. Dies out of shock. How could it be? New Pope is, is elected. A new crusade is called. It's called the King's Crusade, Third Crusade. The king of France, the king of Germany, the king of England, all kings are taking part in the crusade. King Philip and King Richard and uh, uh, Frederick of Barbarossa, different kings. But it's a shambles. They get there and one of the kings drowns in the sea, his army leaves back home. They get to Jaffa, if I remember. You know, and then they dispute amongst themselves. One party leaves back home. Richard is left by himself. And Salah Adin, in his life, he also has defeats, by the way. Like in Jaffa, Arsuf, Acre. But he perseveres, persistent perseveres. And 1193, Salah Adin becomes very ill. Very ill. He used to sweat like if it was uh, like you know he couldn't tell if it was hot or if it was cold and he used to get confused and people saw deterioration in his health that keep their four Quran reciters around him. Salah Adin loved Quran reciters. He would pay kids, he would pay stipends, you know, for kids to learn the Kothariya. You know Kothariya from Surah Al Kothar in authentic Al Kothar, those small surahs. Everyone had to know the Kothariya. All the young kids had to know at least the basic minimum. He built madrasas. Madrasa Salahiyya, Madrasa al fadiliya Mashhad al Hussein, all these big madrasas around Cairo, Syria, built this enterprise around him of piety. But 1193, he gets very ill. So people are coming. 
a grieving, a worrying about him. His son, Zakir, he comes to visit the father because he thinks the father you know, is very ill. Go to Damascus. And Salah al-Din gives his advice to him. He says to him, Allah. My first advice to you is to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that is the head of all affairs. The Prophet Salam, you know, he was riding with Abdullah ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas was small. He says, Ya Ghulam, O oh young boy, I will teach you some words. Learn them. Be mindful of Allah, Allah will keep and protect you. Always in your life, always ask yourself first, will Allah be pleased with me if I do such and such thing? If I say this word, will Allah be pleased with me? If I speak like that to my parents, will Allah be pleased with me? And be the best you can. He says, when you ask, You ask, ask from Allah. Seek refuge, seek refuge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَلَمْ أَنَّ مَا أَخْطَعَكْ لَمْ يَكُنْ يُصِيبَكْ وَمَا أَصَابَكْ لَمْ يَكُنْ يُخْطَعَكْ Whatever missed you in life was ever going to strike you, whatever struck you in life was ever going to miss you. And know that Nasr success was with patience. And with hardship, there is ease. Salah Hadin says to his son, Beware in your life of grudges, because death spares nobody. Beware of holding grudges. Don't sleep, and there's some malice in your heart against another Muslim. Never sleep like that. If you feel like that, pick up the phone and send a beautiful text message or make a phone call or send some food, send a gift, send something to repair that because let nothing count against you in the Let nothing be against you when you die. That this thing was against you. Don't want to be. May Allah save all of us. But whatever you can recognize today, fix it now before tomorrow comes. So as he's telling his son, don't let that be your end because death will not spare you like it's not sparing me now. And Salah Adin, that year he dies, Rahimullah. They said that, you know, that the loss was so was so, felt throughout the entire Ummah. Because here was a man that worked to unify the entire Ummah and then to liberate a land that's important for the entire Ummah. And to bring back for the Muslims a masjid important for the entire Ummah. I'm going to end there, but I'm going to give you one few things to think about. Number one, everybody has a skill, a strength. You know, I'll tell you something amazing. Do you remember as Sulami, the one who wrote the book, Kitab al Jihad, in the, after the first crusade? I said he wrote the book, but not much of an uh, in attendance. His name was Ali ibn Tar al-Sulami. He wrote the first, first book against the First Crusade. 1105. It was a Shafi Faqih of the great mosque of Damascus. He died next day, 1106. That book, it was good for his time maybe, but it just didn't have effect. In the Battle of Hattin, that we went through in 1186, they were deciding which book should we choose to enthuse the Muslim armies to fight in this campaign against Crusaders. You know whose text they chose? A Sulami's text. They could have chosen any text on planet Earth, they chose his one. So never discredit your, your work and your worth. Never think that you might say something today and will have no effect, or you write something that has no effect. But have belief, yaqeen, that whatever you do is a witness for you in this life and the next life. The Prophet says in the hadith, don't belittle any ma'roof, any good deed, even smiling at your brother with a good cheerful face. Maybe the brother you're smiling at is having a hard day, depression or something. Maybe you enliven his spirit. 
with those words. Never therefore underestimate your words, your actions. Everything has a, has a, has a meaning behind it, has weight behind it. So therefore, everybody know your strengths. When I was in school, I was, I was weak, in fact, in sciences. And you know, for some odd reason, the teacher used to make people, like, in the classroom, if you came first, you sit at the front. I was never at the front. <laughs> bulim. That's a bulim. Never, if you're a teacher, don't do that. <laughs> it's very bad. This is very bad. I was never even on the front row. Even on the second row. You know, but I was very good, alhamdulillah, in the humanities, in English, in history. I was very good. Uh, so I was more... But everybody has a strength, strength. And my best friend was very good in maths in school. Like he could outdo all the people in maths. We had one girl came from a foreign country, subhanAllah. She couldn't even speak English. But she was the best artist. Honestly, she was the best in doing art. Everybody has a skill. Either you're good in this or good in that. This. But use your skill. Not everybody, not everybody is a sulim. You could write the book on jihad. But not everybody is a Ibn Khayrat. You could write the poem. A word you write the poem. Not everybody is Il Ghazi that can lead the army. Not everybody is Qalij al Salah that can lead the army. Everybody has a different skill, but use your skill. And remember this hadith. The Prophet Aziz, he says that Ihras Allah may infaq. A very important hadith. He said, Be eager to do what will benefit you. Have a, like a plan of action in your life, young people. Make a plan. Write it down. Make a five year, ten year plan. Say in five years' time, I want to be there. If you don't make plans and targets, then you won't reach your goals because they're just kind of in the air somewhere. But say to yourself, no, this is my skill set and this is what I want to be and that's my goal and that's my target. Could be anything. Maybe you're good in computing. Maybe you're good in writing stories. Whatever things you can use for the ummah, but do it. Wasta'in billah. And the Prophet says, seek Allah's help and assistance. Whatever you do in your life, never feel, okay, I've done it, but it's not working. Raise your hands to Allah. Ask Allah for, for guidance. Allah is Al-Hadi. Allah is going to guide you in your heart, your footsteps. Maybe you're going to change your plan, that's fine, but don't give up. Remember the story of Maryam and Hannah and Zakaria. It's a girl, but she never gave up. She was determined that the plant would grow if it had someone cultivating the growth. Keep good company around yourself, people who will inspire, motivate you. Keep company people who will like, you know, say good things and help you in the project. Don't keep, keep company with like people who are depressing and kind of going to put you, put you down, no. Be around positive people. And the third advice he gives is, and don't give up. Don't give up. Don't feel as if you can't do it, you can do it. And that's very key for us now. I would say motivate the Muslims, create the sense of ummah, brotherhood amongst yourselves. Be good in giving sadaqah, helping those who are in need. Young people, take responsibility around yourself and your families for your moms and for your dads. Don't let your mom carry the shopping around, that's your job, man. Be responsible. Responsible. That will help you in life. And may Allah aid and assist all of you. And make this a masjid, a masjid of, of great iman, building great growth for all of you. May Allah help the Muslimin of Gaza, of Palestine, of Kashmir, of, of Hind, of China, of all places. May Allah aid and assist them. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.